Okay. I uh, appreciate you having me on today. And uh, like I say, we don't have enough time to take us all the way through all the post-harvest stuff. We're just going to cover mostly just getting the orchard floor ready and harvesting and up to the point of drying the pecans. Uh, but we're not really going to go into storage temperatures and grading out pecans and all that kind of stuff. But we'll cover the basics on harvesting and stuff today. Um, so with that, I, one of the first things you have to do in any orchard to get it ready and get everything prepared is, of course, you need to remove the sticks and, and debris that you may have in the orchard. And if you're just a homeowner, most of the time you're just taking a rake out there in your hand, picking up all the limbs and stuff like that. But once you start getting to have quite a few trees uh, that you need to harvest, I mean, they do make small limb rakes, uh, which work really good behind ATVs. And so if you just have a few trees, these are relatively inexpensive. And so you can use these limb rakes to drag the limbs out. But if you have over 100 trees or more and you just need a, a lot bigger area to rake limbs on and everything, and they make much larger limb rakes that you can use to, to drag these out. And I would recommend you get as much of the, the debris and limbs out of the orchard as you can, because I, I promise you, if you leave a a foot long stick on the orchard there that's you know inch and a half two inches in diameter it's going to get caught in the chain in the harvester and you're going to spend a morning or an afternoon crawled up inside the harvester trying to saw a limb out of the chain because it's lodged up there and just stopped everything and uh like i say so the more debris that you can get out of the less you're going to deal with that later on as you do the rest of the processes after harvesting and so the limb works work really good and like i say so those are always a good first step to, to kind of go through and and get all the lambs out of the orchard this fall and during the year that you've been ignoring as you were spraying and taking care of all the other stuff. Um, the other things you need to consider though also is, is hog damage. I like I say, um, this needs to be corrected. If you're not, you're gonna lose a lot of your pecans and all the divots and stuff from hog damage. And this seems to be a, a, a bigger and bigger problem in multiple states now. Um, so you need to correct that. if. This is just a small spot right here that I'm showing in this window here. So I would just try to level up that one area without tearing up the ground around it. Uh, I had an orchard here that was damaged so bad that we had to go through and actually redo all the rows. I mean, this is, we had, you know, from a wet spring, we had ruts all in the rows and stuff from dragging a sprayer through there, trying to keep things sprayed. And so it was rutted up and then we had hog damage on top of that. And so you know, we had to go through and, I try to, you know, till the ground as shallow as possible, but at least enough to fill all the divots and stuff in. And, and the reason this becomes a problem is if you go really deep and then you get like a three inch rain right before harvest and all that loose soil is there, I mean, you just have a big mud pit and you can't really get in and harvest anyway because the ground's been so soft. So, I mean, it's one of those things you need to do enough tillage to work it up so you can level those spots off but you want to do it as shallow as possible so you have firm ground underneath. And, and so it's just one of those things that's going to take some practice to, to kind of get it the way that you want it to be. But just to give you an idea about how much you can lose, uh, we did a, a study down the Red River several years ago. Um, and if in just a typical orchard with no hog damage, if you just go through because of all the, the divots and gopher holes and where mole runs have caved in and things like that, you generally lose roughly about 10% of the nuts that are just not going to be picked up by your harvester the first pass through an orchard. But if you throw in the damage from the pigs and everything, we actually, with pig damage there, we lost 43.7% of the nuts were not picked up by the harvester in an orchard. So that's a third of your crop was left in the orchard because we didn't manage the hog damage that we had. And that really reduces your harvest efficiency that you have. And so that's one of those things that you think, well, I'm not going to lose that much, but in reality, you can lose quite a few pecans in there because I'm mean, just a, a one foot hole. You can have a pound of pecans fall in that hole and not be picked up by the harvester. It'll just go right over the top and those fingers can't get in that divot area and you'll leave those in the orchard. And so it, it does become important to make sure you have that orchard floor as prepared and smooth as possible. Now, another thing we always have to consider is if you've kind of not used enough herbicide or else you've just kind of let things get out of hand growing and things like that. And of course with mowing, uh, most of you are probably going to have, you know, the standard rotary mowers that you're going to have. And those are great for mowing really fast over big areas and things like that. I mean, it's pretty cheap to replace the blades on typical rotary mowers and stuff like that. And so that's what most people are going to have. And so that's kind of what we're talking about with the rotary mowers with the blades. And those are easily replaced and relatively inexpensive. 
And so here are just mowing with the rotary mower, but I find for preparing for harvest that I am able to prepare the orchard floor a lot better with a flail mower. Uh, with the flail mower, I say that's a basically you have a drum that has many blades on it that rotates as you spin. And with a flail mower, you can set the height really exact and get it cut down nice and short. But the thing that a flail mower do that a rotary typically will not do is it will tear up any debris that's on the orchard floor. So if you've got old pecans from say when you crop thin in August and had all those nuts laying around and, or you have small twigs that the, the limb rake didn't get out, that flail mower will chop all that into little bitty pieces as you go through and then prepare that. So here's what a typical flail mower is gonna look like with the little roller in the back and all the blades are in the front. Uh, looking at the blade structure, here's what the, it's gonna look like. And, and these are expensive, so I typically don't drag the flail mower out except at harvest. And the rest of the time I leave it in the barn because you know if you try to replace all those blades, it's gonna cost you probably at least three or $4,000 to replace all the blades on the flail mower. But, if you're only using it to prepare the orchard floor, I'm not wearing it out that fast. And so I typically keep the flail mower in the barn except right before harvest and use that at that time and really get the orchard floor prepared. And then I just use a rotary mower the rest of the time in the orchard. Um, but like I said, that's a, something you need to do is make sure you get the grass cut. Because if you have really tall, clumpy grass and stuff, you can lose a lot of pecans that the fingers can't pick up for the big piles of grass and stuff. Um, and, and like I say, another thing you can do, and I just talked to an orchard, uh, uh, grower probably about three weeks ago that was getting ready to, is some people will just go through and bale right before harvest. So that gets all the grass out of there. You don't leave the big clumps of grass. If you let it get out of hand and everything, and that's what he was going to do. He had a herbicide strip, but he left the grass and gotten tall between the rows of trees. And so they're going to just come through and bale it all and get the hay bales out. And that is going to get his grass nice and short with not a bunch of piles of dead grass laying around and getting hung up in the harvester. And so you can do that. The only thing I'd warn you about if you are going to bale before harvest is to make sure that you replace the nutrients that you're taking out. I mean, you're taking out quite a bit of, of nitrogen and potassium and phosphorus out of the orchard every time you bale. Uh, so that is something you need to kind of take a look at and, and make sure you replace the nutrients that you're removing from it because of the hay that you're taking out of the orchard. And that's true if you're just doing baling all season long. I mean, I have growers that that's what they'll do. They may cut and bale the orchard, you know, three or four times during the season, but you just have to make sure that you're fertilizing for both the trees and you're fertilizing for the hay crop and the nutrients that you're removing. That way you're not going in the reverse direction and having a negative impact on the orchard overall. Just manage those two separately and fertilize the grass for hay and fertilize the trees for production. Of course, once you reach that point of view, I mean, you've got to get the nuts out of the trees, especially if you're doing an early harvest and things like that. So shaking wise, this is how we used to do it. This is this picture was probably made in the 70s and we didn't have a lot of the shakers and stuff. And you went around with cane poles and you beat the limbs and stuff like that. And if you just had a few trees and you had somebody that didn't mind climbing, you might send them up in a tree and they get high enough, they can grab a limb and shake everything back and forth. And they're just shaking as fast as they can, trying to get as many nuts as they can to fall out. Uh, but nowadays we really don't have to deal with it that way. We have a lot easier ways to do it. I mean, you can either use a three point hitch harvester that hooks up behind the tractor and you can get these in different widths and uh, those work really good. Or if you have a little more cash or a bigger orchard, you can move to a monoboom shaker. Uh, new modern booms right now are probably running about $140,000 a piece. So you need to have a pretty big orchard to justify one. Uh, but the modern booms do really well and uh, uh, getting the nuts out of the tree as well. And they work really fast. You notice the little spinners in front and behind the wheels. So you're not running over pecans because they're going to clean out, you know, front and back. Whereas on the tractors and stuff, often you may have to have someone there with a rake that's raking out around the tractor, tractor tires. So you're not running over nuts that you shake out of the tree. Uh, you can shake on the tarps, and I know some growers that just have a few trees, so they don't have a harvester. They just, you know, either borrow their neighbor's shaker and come in and shake on the tarps and harvest their crop. Uh, so you can do that, shake directly on tarps and just bag those up instead of using a regular harvester. If you really have a big orchard, catch frames are available, but they only work on trees with a canopy up to about 30 feet. So once the trees get bigger than a 30-foot canopy, they're going to be throwing nuts well outside the canopy of the catch frame. 
And these are really expensive. I and mean, the few orchards I've seen that ran these typically had a minimum of probably 2,500 acres of trees and they're running them 24 hours a day, except for an hour down to change out the hydraulic fluid and check all the lines. So they're running with, with stage lights and running them 23 hours and down for an hour just to replace everything and check all, all the connections and stuff like that. So you have to be a pretty big operation to afford to use the catch frame. Now, if you are harvesting pecans early and you know, it's still kind of warm, we still have a bunch of green leaves on the trees and stuff, the bark may be a little bit loose when you're shaking the trees. Uh, so you have to remember if you are shaking early, this is what will happen if you don't have the pads greased well. Uh, you can rip the whole sheet of the bark up on that top left. That was probably three minutes after they ripped the bark off of that tree and I just flipped it over and leaned it on the tree and you can see how big of a chunk they ripped off. And that's going to take probably seven to 10 years to heal that spot up. It will heal up, but uh, you don't want to damage the tree trunks that bad. It won't kill the tree, but it will definitely uh, suffer over several years to heal itself back up. But you'll still be able to harvest those trees. But you just need to be careful with your shakers. And I'm talking about different shaker pads. Of course, in the old days, we had the pads on the left, which were the cylindrical pads. Those were usually filled with crushed walnut hulls or crushed pecan uh, shell, well, not hulls, but shells, walnut shells or pecan shells. And those were pretty easy to rip the bark on trees when they moved to the donut pads on the right. I mean, those have a wider surface area, get a better grip on the tree. And we don't have as much of a problem of ripping the bark, but still you can see that flap that hangs down over both of them. Usually if you lift that flap up, it's gonna be dry underneath there and that's not what you want. Because what's gonna happen with the dry flap is that rubber is gonna grip and where it's gonna slip is between the pad and the trunk of the tree. So that's when you're ripping the bark off the tree. So you need to make sure you grease that really well. I mean, you can use just regular axle grease, you see on the left, or you can spray silicon sprays on there. The grease on the left usually lasts for a few more shakings over what silicon spray is. You gotta spray it a little bit more often, but you really just need to make sure that you have those pads well greased. And that way, if something's gonna slip, it's gonna be between the pad and the flap that slips, not the bark on the tree that gets ripped off. And so just make sure you lubricate everything and check those every so often when you're out shaking trees to make sure that you're not ripping the bark off the trees. Another thing you need to consider is, did you have a recent rain? Often when you get a rain and the trees are still active, that bark will start floating for at least two or three days. So usually if I get a more than an inch rain, I won't shake a tree for at least three or four days after I got that rain, just to give the tree time to kind of get that bark firm back up before you start shaking. As far as harvesting the pecan nuts, of course, first thing you need to do is probably get everything moved away from the trees. In small orchards, we just use a backpack blower. You can go through with a leaf blower and blow all the nuts out from around the tree trunks because you don't want to get close with the harvester and knock a chunk out of the tree trunk with the harvester trying to pick everything up. So blow around your irrigation risers, blow around the tree trunk, get those nuts away from those so you can pick everything up. If you're a bigger orchard, of course, you're going to move to the three-point hitch blower. It gives, it gives you a better airflow and, and makes it a lot quicker job. Oftentimes you have a wind rower on the front of that. So you can see the blower on the back of this one. And we come back around the other way, you can see the wind rower on the other side and you can see how clean that floor is where the herbicide, herbicide strip is. There's really not any nuts laying around right there. It's really nice and clean. The orchard's been prepared well and he's gonna get all his nuts up when he does the harvest. And that's kind of what you're shooting for. As far as ways to actually harvest the pecans, I and mean, there's a number of ways, I mean, Often if you've, if you've got a, you know, your wife might be a school teacher or you might be a school teacher. And if you can get the kiddos to come out with your class and give them a paper sack, they love to spend a couple hours picking up pecans. We used to bring the Montessori school out and the little four-year-olds, they would pick up pecans. Of course, I just give them what they picked up. But, you know, that's, a, that's one way you can pick up pecans. Of course, you have these little small, you know, bag of pecan and stuff like that. If you just have a few trees in your yard around the house that you can go through and these do a reasonably good job if you get rid of all the leaves, you may have to take a leaf blower or a rake and get most of the leaves out of the way and then they pick the pecans up really well. Uh, so just for small operations, those work fine. But as we move up into larger and more trees, they do make small harvesters. Uh, this one's only about four feet wide and like you can pull it behind an ATV or a gator or anything else like that. And it does a reasonably good job as long as there's not a lot of leaves on the ground. This works really good on early varieties like candy and, and Kansa and, and Pawnee and things like that, where you have the nuts on the ground, but not a lot of debris or leaves on the ground. And then you pick up mostly nuts. But the problem I found with these small ones, they don't have enough wind flow. 
that when you get all the leaves off the tree and on the ground, you're probably picking up about 80% leaves and about 20% nuts that you have to clean out later on. So your sacks fill up pretty fast. Uh, but those work reasonably good if you just have a few trees. And as I said, you can continue moving up to larger and larger ones. I and mean, here we have a, a uh, row harvester um, that you can do wind rows with. You can see he's driving through. Uh, those have the dump wagon right behind it. You can have it where he's dumping into a, a different wagon and stuff. Those work really good when you have a, a large orchard. Those are a lot faster than using the ones because you can fill that hopper up and just change out. Uh, the wagon behind it and then put another one behind it and go really fast and just leave somebody pick that up later on. So those are different ways that you can do as far as harvesting. I mean, those all work basically the same way with the rubber fingers and everything. If you've ever seen a road sweep work uh, and they're, they're working about the same way as a road sweep, but you just have rubber fingers on there. But that's where it becomes really important on the harvest uh, from the point of view is if you leave you know, a lot of stops sticking up or big clumps of grass that didn't get mowed off well, you can start ripping rubber fingers out of those types of harvesters. And that's a long day to change out fingers in one of those harvester canisters and stuff. That's a, that's a process that you only want to do one time a year and you prefer to do it at the end of the season. But, uh, you know, if you get into some really heavy vegetation or get into some areas uh, with stobs sticking up where you had big stuff that you mowed down, but you still have a one inch stob sticking up from amaranth or, you know, pigweed or something like that. Those will break some of those fingers off or else just rip them out completely. And, and that makes it much less efficient on picking up the nuts on the ground when you start losing the half fingers that's on the, on the drum. And so just that's where the orchard prep really comes in, in handy to make sure you have a nice smooth floor and that way you don't have to replace those fingers uh, on your harvester that often. Of course, as far as field cleaning and things are concerned, uh, and this is one of the things that we always consider um, um, before you head to it. And, and I'll just go ahead and mention, you need, need to have an idea about how you're gonna process your pecans and everything. Um, with field cleaners, this is kind of the setup we're talking about. And you know, we have our harvester on the right, you can dump straight into the pre-cleaner. And, and basically a pre-cleaner has a uh, aspirator on it, and, you know, a wind leg, it's gonna be able to blow most of the trash out in the field. And that way you don't have to bring all that debris with you um, to, the, to the barn and everything. And so uh, they can be very important, especially if you're going, because when you, when you look at commercial cleaners, you know, if you're not gonna be cleaning your pecans yourself, so you're gonna take them to a commercial cleaner, uh, often those are set up two different ways. Either you pay for everything that you bring in when you bring it in, and, and I'll give you an instance, there's one here in Oklahoma, it's four and a half cents for every pound that you bring into the plant. And that's whatever you bring in, that's debris, that's pecans, that's sticks, that's mud balls. I mean, you're paying four and a half cents on whatever you bring in. So in that situation, you wanna make sure that you've cleaned the nuts as best as you can before you take them in. Because in that situation, you're just paying them for mud and sticks and stuff that you could have cleaned out instead of having nuts. Now, the other way that cleaning plants will process pecans is you will pay generally a nine or 10 cents. I've seen as high as 12 cents per pound on the finished product. Now, in that situation, you're not paying for any debris you have in here. You're only paying for the finished good nuts at the end of the processing. And so in that situation, yeah, if you don't get them cleaned up quite as well, well, you're not really being charged for that at the cleaning plant. That's going to be removed and you're already paying that 10 or 12 cents on the finished good pecans that come out the other side. Uh, so you just need to make sure if you are going to have them commercially clean, you know, what side are you paying on and, and what the impact of having really clean nuts versus not so clean nuts are going to have on your wallet uh, when you bring those in and start paying off the final bill. So that's kind of how that works. Like I say, you can do it in the field. I mean, here you can see where one's been used in the field and you can just have it go straight to a truck to haul for a final cleaning at the plant uh, if you want to. And that huge pile of, of nuts right there, that's really not what you want to see. That means that tells me I've got a lot of pops, a lot of lightweight pecans that got blew out by the first aspirator and everything. So that tells me that I didn't do a really good job of uh, taking care of my nuts that year. You want that pile not to be quite as large. Um, you'd rather more go into the truck that's good pecans than be blown out on the ground. But like I say, on, on some years, especially this year, I've seen a lot of damage from uh, 
chuckworm and from a number of different things. And uh, so there has been a lot of blowout in some places. I've seen some orchards that probably blew out 40% of the pecans that got picked up uh, this year from either scab damage. We had a lot of scab pressure this year from chuckworm, from, from weevil damage. And so there has been a lot of blowout this year I've seen so far in a lot of locations, uh, as well as bagworms up in the Northeast part of the state. Um, you can have an inline you know, cleaner right before you take it into your shed. Uh, here's one where you just have a, a, a dump pit and you dump into the pit, it goes up the auger. And once again, you just have that first central airflow leg right there. That's just an aspirator blowing all the leaves and chucks and stuff and debris out and lightweight stuff. All the heavy stuff will still go up the conveyor belt and go into the plant. But that just kind of gives you an idea of pre-cleaning needs to be done to remove as much of the debris as you can. Like I say, that's just more efficient from your situation. It's easier to dry all pecans than it is to dry, you know, 50% of it shucks and sticks and stuff like that, not pecans. This is kind of what you're shooting for. This is the end product once it's gone through a pre-cleaner. And uh, you do have those stick tights that are in there that are still green, but those will come out on the next leg of processing. You see it's mostly pecans. You don't have very much debris in there at all. All the leaves have been blown out. There's no shucks hanging around really other than the green shucks on the stick tights. And so that's done a reasonably good job. And you'll further clean that up and get those stick tights out. And that'll be almost all pecans once you've done the processing on it. So that's kind of what you're shooting for. If you do have some stick tights or some shucks that just aren't opening up, this is especially common if you're, you know, have some wind storms that blow some pecans out that may have just a slightly premature and they just didn't get opened up well. Or else you have some shuck worm that the shucks don't open well and they do make d holes with brushes. Some use wire brushes, some are just stiff plastic brushes to kind of clean some of those loose shucks off of there to try and maximize what you get out of the orchard. But a lot of places don't have these, but some of the bigger cleaning plants will have these to kind of clean things up a little bit. Now, while you're doing your harvesting and everything, it's really important that you also kind of look to see, you know, how well did you do your management when you're harvesting? And so there's some things you look for and you know, what, what are things that you might find? Of course, the first thing you need to consider is how much are you losing to predators? Uh, you know, we're going to have a lot of crows. We're going to have a lot of squirrels. And if you look at typically squirrels are going to take about a half a pound, crows up to a pound a day. So if you got a flock of 100 crows in there, that's 100 pounds a day that's walking out the door. Uh, so you need to make sure that you use either the propane cannons or, you know, the scare tapes, you know, you have the, the bird tapes, bird scare tapes, uh, or something like that. But anything that you use is going to have to be moved around. You just can't let it sit in one location. And the crow figures out really fast if the sound's coming from one spot in the orchard every day, and they'll start ignoring that completely. So uh, anything that you use to scare them, um, you know, the, the propane cannons and stuff, you need to move those around at least every week. To a different location in the orchard and also you probably need to reinforce that with either using a shotgun or of course nowadays you can get the little pyrotechnic pistols where you can shoot whistlers at them or exploding pyrotechnics that you can shoot at them so you can just shoot right up in the flock as they're leaving the orchard and stuff and so those have helped out with scaring a little bit as well a lot of people for the squirrels if you set your orchard up correctly and you have a good wide space and you need at least 100 to 150 feet between you and the woods, then the squirrels don't like to cross that big open area because of eagles and owls and stuff like that. Um, but other than that, some people use the traps in the orchard to catch the squirrels and stuff like that, or else have squirrel hunters come in during the season, which is during pecan season is squirrel season. So you can have hunters come in on your place and take some of the squirrels out if you're having a problem with squirrels. Another common problem that you're going to see is vivipary. Uh, I will say this year I've seen the, probably about the least amount of vivipary I've seen in the last 10 years at least. Uh, I've just not had that much of an issue. Usually this is a stress problem. Either the trees were overloaded, you're a little bit droughty and the shucks aren't opening so the nut matures and it just starts growing on the tree. Uh, and, you know, some varieties are really bad about it. I've seen, you know, 70 or 80 percent of the nuts on a tree sprout on the tree before the shucks open. And of course, anytime you have that radical start to extend, that kernel is pretty much wasted now. It's going to turn yellow and black and it's not going to be uh, fit to eat. And so it just gets thrown out with all the other trash and stuff. And so you want to reduce vivipary as best as you can. Remove the stress that you have. Make sure that you're, you know, if you have irrigation, you're keeping the trees irrigated to reduce the water stress on the trees. And so that's something you need to look for and see how much vivipary you have. As I said, it does differ between varieties. I mean, here's Sumner. 
uh, this particular year, Sumner only had 1.6% of the nuts actually, uh, you know, sprouted on the tree. Or if you compare that to Nakono, the same year, the same orchard, probably just a few trees down from that Sumner, uh, Nakono had almost 56% of the nuts sprouted in the tree. And so you have, have to have an idea about when you're selecting varieties to try and choose some that, I mean, Pawnee seems to be fairly bad about sprouting. Nakono under the right situations will sprout relatively bad. Uh, so you need to kind of take that into consideration when choosing varieties because it can cost you down the road if you're losing half your, half your crop to vivipary. So that's something you need to consider as well. Of course, we have all kinds of stink bugs around that love to get into pecan crops. And this is especially true if you have any agronomic crops growing close to you. If you've got a cotton field or a soybean field next to your orchard, as soon as they go in and harvest those beans and stuff, all those stink bugs that are out there are going to move into the orchard. And, and of course, that's going to be a situation. You have a leaf-footed bug on the bottom left down there. We have two different species uh, of leaf-footed bugs that basically show the same damage as stink bugs, which is pretty much, you know, let's see a pecan that looks like this. And if you start getting very much, you know, stink bug damage on your kernels and stuff, that's really going to cost you when you sell the pecans um because they're going to have to dock you on pay and everything because you can't use those kernels they, and they're going to have a very poor quality taste uh as well as the damage that you see is the visual side of it uh so you need to make sure you you know keep the stink bugs under control and everything you know if you in an area where you already have weevils most of the time when you're spraying for weevils you're taking stink bugs out as well but for those of you that if you don't have to deal with the problem of weevils you may need to make sure you monitor for stink bugs and, and spray for stink bugs in the orchard is well, that reduce the damage that you see here. Just to give you an idea, when you're in the orchard, things you're looking at, and you know, if you look on this particular shot right here, you see that small hole there. And if you're in weevil country, a lot of people say, well, that's a weevil. But if you cut into the shuck, you find out that's just shuckworm damage. And that's where a shuckworm has already emerged out of the shuck. Um, so generally for shuckworm, I'm not sure if, if Jackie's already covered insects. I'm sure she probably has, uh, but I'm not sure. But chuckworm usually, we go through an orchard at harvest time. And, you know, if you're seeing, you know, more than 20% of your nuts that you're harvesting, having either shuckworm trails on the actual shell, or if you're cutting some shucks open and seeing the shuckworm damage, you probably need to start with the spray in, you know, mid to late July. Otherwise, most of the time you wait till you're about half shell hardening. Uh, in an orchard to spray for shuckworm, but it can be quite devastating if you get a number of, of worms in each shuck. Because you have to realize that shuck is where all the uh, uh, vascular tissue is that's feeding that nut. So the more that shuckworm eats, the less it can feed that pecan nut. And so if you have early shuckworm damage, most of those nuts will all be pops. And so it is, it can be a quite devastating, but just to kind of give you an idea, this is shuckworm. Now we're gonna go, this is weevil. If you look at the nut on the left, shuckworm, weevil. Not a lot of difference when you're looking at the shuck and everything. So you pretty much have to remove some of that shuck to realize, you know, do you have a worm feeding on the shuck and destroying the tissue? Or do you just have a weevil that drilled through and that's its exit hole where it's actually finished eating everything on the inside of the pecan and now it's drilled out and through the shuck and falling on the ground. Uh, so you need to kind of check your pecans as you're harvesting and see what kind of damage you're seeing from both of those insects. Of course, once you get in the shelling plant and everything and start shelling, then this is more of what you're going to see on the right, uh, where we did have uh, weevil in there and you're usually going to have three or four of them in, in a pecan. And as you can see, that pecan is not worth eating anymore. It's been pretty much eaten up by the weevils and destroyed. And so you need to monitor those things and see where you have problems, areas in the orchard at the time of harvest. And you'll, you know, and that's true for a number of different diseases. I always look for phylloxera, see where I have problems on the leaves with phylloxera. You look to see where you had chuckworm damage, you look to see in what orchard you had weevil damage in. And so you can make notes for next year so that you know when you're planning those things out, what your kind of care you're going to be doing next year, that you have the insecticides and stuff available to go ahead and treat for those insects uh, on time so you don't have this type of damage occurring in your crop. Because the crop only goes one way. You start out with the most you're going to have, and every month through the whole season into the fall, the crop's getting smaller and smaller. And so anything you can do to reduce that reduction, you're going to have more at the end of the year. And so I'll, I'll always make notes when I'm harvesting to go through and, and just make a few notes on what I'm seeing in the orchard as far as insect damage and disease damage and stuff like that. 
that's just going to help you manage better the following year once you can look at your problem spots and, and have that planned out for next year. Of course, well, in the early harvest of pecans, if we do it really early, generally those are going to come out of the orchard with too high of a moisture content, uh, which can be really bad. Uh, because if I have a really high moisture content and I have those sitting in the wagon with no air on it, those are just going to start molding and rotting and I'm going to lose the kernel that's going to deteriorate. And so if you're coming out of an orchard with really high moisture content, uh, you know, typically at early shuck split, you're looking at 25 to 30 percent moisture in the nut, even if they've been laying around on the ground for a little bit. But if it's rainy and stuff, you can still have 8 to 10 percent moisture in those nuts. And really, we want to have them down for storage, you know, between four and four and a half percent, definitely under six percent for any type of, of storage at all. Um, and so we need to get that moisture down. That's typically done by you know, using drying bins and stuff. And that's a peanut wagon you're looking at on the left and just a jet dryer on the right. And those are two of the most common apparatuses you're going to see for drying nuts and everything. Um, top right, the multi-grain meter, that's usually a, a grain moisture meter, but it can be adapted and used on pecans as well to see how much moisture you have in the nuts. Uh, but as far as just some different situations in drying and stuff, I mean, if you're in West Texas, I mean, they can just pile them up out there because they're at, you know, 10% humidity and they have no moisture. So everything stays dry and it's not going to rain anyway. So they can get away with doing big piles out in the open like that. You know, in some areas, bigger orchards, they'll use big bins where you can you know, dry 100,000 pounds in these wooden bins and stuff and, and dry them. Then just airflow, just standard air, no heat or anything because they're dry enough humidity. They can dry, do a pretty good job drying. Uh, for smaller growers, like I so said, you can use these boxes and, and with a jet dryer and you can take a scaffold manifold there and, and with that manifold, break it into different hoses. So right there, they're drying 4,000 pounds pecans. Each box holds about 1,000 pounds pecans. And so you can drive about 4,000 at a time with one blower. And that works reasonably good for small growers and stuff. As you move to a little bit larger grower that may have his own cleaning plant, uh, right below the ladder right there, that big bin right there, that's a drying bin. You can see the jet dryer that goes in the, in the hole on the left. Uh, that'll drive about 4,000 pounds as well. So he can clean them on the right. You've got a stick reel and everything, and he's gonna clean all the dirt clods out. And he's got an air leg, and those are gonna go into the drying and get dried and then as it comes out the other side with the conveyor belt that's going to go into a sizer and size the pecans so that's just a nice easy operation to go from cleaning to drying to sizing and he's getting everything ready to go uh, your really large cleaners of course they're going to have multiple drying bins every place you see a clipboard on the left there that's a drying bin and they're all numbered and so he can have multiple people's pecans in there and he's drying those. You can see all the fans on the backside of it, all those are heated air. Uh, so they can send those through to dry the pecans if you're in a high humidity area. Uh, but if you're in a drier area, you don't have to have the heat on there at all. But when we discuss that, um, as far as the, the heating air and everything, we never want to have that air hotter than about 95 degrees. When you start getting up to 100 degrees on your temperatures, on your dryers and stuff, you'll start decaying, you know, deteriorating the pecans are just getting too hot, uh, especially in the inner part of that uh, wagon and stuff. And so we never try to keep the temperature more than 95 degrees. And most of the time I just actually dry with just air and don't even turn the heat on and just use the air that I have. Um, or if you have a barn where you just have a, a regular heater in the barn, you can just turn the heater on in the barn and that'll keep the humidity low and you can recycle that air in the barn and get a lot of that moisture out. Uh, that way, but generally you're looking, um, you, know, you want to keep the drier air below 60% moisture. You want to have the airflow at least 90 cubic feet, uh, you know, on the square footage of your drying area. And it's all going to depend on how much moisture you have in the pecans when they come in. Most of the time you can dry pecans down in two or three days, but I mean, if they're really wet and it's humid, it may take you more like four or five days to dry those pecans down. Now you don't have to deal with this is, is this is something I would check with if I'm taking my pecans to be cleaned for me. If I'm taken to a location, I need to know if they have drying facilities available because I don't want to take a bunch of wet pecans over there if they don't have drying facilities available and they're sitting in a wagon and molding for several days before they can get to them. Because you know, in the height of the season, they may have, you know, 25 to 35 peanut wagons out there of different people's pecans and they'll get to yours but maybe two or three days once you bring them up there and if they're sitting there at 
20% moisture and they don't have drying facilities, they're going to mold for that two days until they get to them to start cleaning them. And so that's something I always check with wherever location I'm going to take. If I don't have my own drying facilities, I'll make sure that I check with the location I'm taking them to, to the cleaning plant I'm taking to, to see if they have drying facilities. And they'll usually charge you for the drying, uh, but it's usually only a penny or two a pound. Usually it's not very high price, but just make sure they either have that available. If they don't have drying available, you need to make sure you get the pecans dried down before you take them to be cleaned. Uh, Cause you don't want wet pecans sitting around. Now, once you get them dried and everything, uh, you can take them out of the dryer in the background. You see that's the inspection table. They're coming right out of those bins, the drying bins, and you've got people pulling any bad pecans or missed things in the cleaning process. And that's all just going straight into super sacks. Uh, and once they're dried to proper moisture content, you, you can put them in super sacks. And if you're too worried about it, you can get super sacks that are actually vented or actually have the ability to put a small blower on to keep air flowing through the bag. Uh, if you're just worried, really worried about them still being a little wet or anything, you can continue drying them in super sack. But most of the time you have them good and dry and you put them in super sacks and they can be stored in those sacks because they're dry and as long as they're in a nice dry bar and location, you can store them for you know, uh, a couple weeks, three or four weeks until you get everything together and you know once you've accumulated all your pecans and everything of course then you're at the process of getting everything packed on and sent to the sheller and uh so like i say you need to just consider all those different types of things uh from the harvest process make sure you just have everything lined up and ready to go the way that you need for them to go um like i said when you're looking at how you do your entire protocol from the time you walk in with your mowers and mow your orchard until you finish, you need to know where you're going every step of the way. You don't want to get a bottleneck and have pecans sitting around uh, and wet and you can't get them in and get them dry. So make sure you know what your capacity is going to be and how quick you can do your drying and have all those logistics figured out ahead of the time so you don't have a bottleneck where everything's just sitting around. Um, and that'll help you get a good quality pecan that you get a good price for.